So welcome again to the 2023 GADMAC um, conference uh, in partnership with Animal Evac in New Zealand and with our platinum sponsor for Paws International. Our next session is about animal welfare information sheet for horse incident response teams. And our presenter is Julie Feidler. So I'm really pleased that we've got Julie with us. Um, she's uh, well known in Australia uh, for all the work that she's done with the horse community in particular, but what she continues to do um, in this uh, is, um, animal emergency space. So Julie, thanks so much for, for being with us today. I'd like to just um, start with a few of the housekeeping tips for those that haven't joined before today. Um, the uh, Zoom chat feature is disabled. If you've got any questions, please put those in the Q&A section and we'll try and get to a few questions at the end of Julie's presentation. This year, we've got the multilingual caption, closed caption function available. So if you need help with translation, you can click on that at the bottom of your screen and choose uh, a language and hopefully get some translation assistance there. We encourage you to use social media and to promote the conference uh, to the rest of the world. And if you can use the hashtag GADMACConf um, for Twitter and social media, that'd be fantastic. And we can get the word out there that we're here and we're all doing our best to improve, improve things for animals and for people. Just as a reminder, we are recording these sessions and these video recordings will be available later. Um, so without further ado, I'd really like to welcome Julie and uh, we we'll look forward to your presentation. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you very much for the introduction, Mel. Um, so my name's Julie Fiedler. I'm the Secretary for Animal Emergency Incident Management Network, Australia and New Zealand. That's a really long name. So from now on, I'm just gonna call that the network. Um, and I'd like to thank our chair, Professor Josh Slater, Josh Slater and Vice Chair David King for uh, assisting with preparing this talk. So as we're talking about animal welfare and also recognising um, within that in the westernised view of animal sentience, I'd first like to pay respect to First Nations people and from many countries and cultures whose spiritual connection with animals and country are of more than human meaningfulness and that may hold different values to Western cultures and Westernised knowledge of animal sentience and welfare and Westernised understanding of the human and animal connection to each other and to country. Um, I also would like to acknowledge the Boonarong and Boonwaring people of whose country this presentation was prepared. Um, what I have on the screen there are the four totem animals that holds special meaning for local Indigenous peoples. At, and they're presented at the Melbourne Veterinary School within the building. So they've got echidna spines, eel scales, possum fur and wedgetail eagle feathers. And on the top right there, we've actually got platypus bubbles that take you through the building to find different things. So they're embedded into the floor. Um, so this slide just shows uh, where Melbourne is on the left uh, in, this, in Australia and then where Werribee is located in relation to Melbourne. So it's about 30 k's west of the central business district. Um, in regard to animal welfare laws in Australia, um, Australia is a federated country. So there are like eight states and territories, each with their own act and regulations. So RSPCA Australia has a list of these on their website and I'll put a click through link on this slide. Now this presentation has been uploaded to um, the network's website and many of the pictures and, and things I have in this presentation are hot linked. So you'll be able to click through and, and download uh, whatever I'm talking about. So New Zealand uh, is lucky enough to be one jurisdiction. So um, they're not impacted in the same way as Australia. That also, as well as the animal welfare laws, um, the emergency management acts differ in each state and territory. And it's only the two states of, um, that I've got a red star there, of South Australia and New South Wales, where animal rescue is written into or able to be done through the emergency management act. In other states, it's by permission or not at all. Um, and New Zealand has it written into their Foreign Emergency Act, so they're, they're cool. So today um, I'll first talk about uh, the network, and which is a new organisation for Australia and New Zealand, and then I'll move on to animal welfare before looking at the tip sheet. So as many um, people would be aware, 
effectively managing incidents involving animals requires uh, bringing people together who normally would not work together and have different expertise and different job roles. So animal incidents require people trained in safety and welfare of people, and then another skill set with people trained in the safety and welfare of animals. And in incident scenes, we'll call these animal patients. Um, so a gap was identified in Australia and a need to have a, a joined up approach to developing policy and practice, um, particularly because we've got so many different laws um, across Australia for welfare and emergency management. So nearly two years ago, the organisation was established and amongst its aims were to advance all aspects of animal emergency incident management and then to advocate these to emergency services, government, veterinary profession and the public. Um, we'd also like to acknowledge support of our sister organisation, the British Animal Rescue Care and Trauma Care Association for assisting us through this. So in its short ex existence, the network's engaged with a range of stakeholders and taken opportunity to advocate for um, incident management involving animals across several areas. Uh, one major achievement was contributing to the Large Animal Rescue Operations Guideline, which I'll talk on the next slide. Um, but also too, we've been on subject matter expert committees for developing units of competency relating to large animal and companion animal emergency, emergency incident. So these have been endorsed by the Australian government for use by registered training providers and by industry. So they uh, work towards your job qualifications. Um, it's believed that these may be the first of their kind in the world. However, if anybody knows about um, any other nationally endorsed vocational training units of competency linked to um, animal emergency incident management, um, we'd love to hear about it um, because these sort of documents always undergo constant review. Um, the network uh, has run two confer conferences, prepared information sheets, presented talks and conferences, and a range of media activities on radio, um, print and TV. So one of the uh, key documents uh, worked through with the organisation to date is um, the Large Animal Rescue Operations Guide. So that was done under the auspices of the Australasian Fire Authorities Council. That's a lead association for emergency services in Australia and New Zealand. So one of their key roles is to work with emergency organisations to develop consistent standards. So for example, in the UK, all the fire chiefs are on board with animal rescue procedures and we look through this document to encourage the same to occur in Australia. So the network um, support developing a consistent approach. Um, so this document is free. It's able to be downloaded. Again, um, a pop link, click there, or you can Google and it should pop up fairly easily. Uh, so the guideline um, was also assisted again through the support of um, Barter's um, experience in this area. So really important to standardize practices across a range of emergency service organisations and this document will help achieve to do that. Okay, so the network also um, identified that there was a need for this uh, tips for responders and thinking about animal welfare. So I'll move on to that now. I've just got a couple of uh, slides there. One left is from our last conference where we link animal welfare and, and the anatomy of animals to lifting techniques. And, and the right is uh, what happens in Australia, we have floods as well. Okay, so one thing I'd like to talk about first, which uh, everyone be aware of is uh, the power of social media and the concept of social license to operate, which is the public perception of the operations of an active, of an organization. And you can imagine uh, animal rescues are often shared on social media. And it's important that we try and work towards the standards approach and keep the message of animal welfare fairly strong. So the public that could be watching are owners or could be people associated with anim animals in trouble, but they will form opinions. And these perceptions of how we do things as well as what we do um, is really important because it uh, ensures that we're able to keep going and doing what we want to do, but we must make sure it's done to a standard. So it means taking a casualty-centred approach. And that 
will involve communication about that because what that means and what that looks like will differ for every situation. So the actions taken at a rescue scene should be informed by appropriate training, data capture and regularly reviewed. Um, so, and these should be reviewed not only at the local incident, but with national and international colleagues. And finally, we also want to think about a holistic approach where the environment is also considered. So animal welfare to rescue scene relates to how, how an animal is coping with the conditions in which they are found. So often, often that is not um, optimum welfare. So an animal requiring rescue or relocation is likely to be already compromised or about to be in a high risk situation. So you may have heard of the five freedoms with its five provisions, which I've got there on the screen, also with click through links. And then the five domains model is um, released in 2020, which includes human and animal interactions. So the five freedoms acts like a handy checklist um, and tells us what to do to keep us keep animals free from suffering and cruelty, such as providing um, water. But the five domains is written very differently. It's written from the perspective or asks us to think about the perspective of the animal. So this is a very general schematic understanding of the five domains model. It's asking not only to think about the traditional aspects, environment, health and nutrition, um, but it's also asking us to think about how all the animal is interacting with people, animals and the environment. And all of these things together contribute to the, the animal's mental state and therefore we can assess their welfare status. When we're at a rescue scene, which is chaotic by nature sometimes, um, really we're looking to promote um, calmness and reduce stress so that we can actually rescue the animal. So I had this cartoon drawn up specifically for this talk um, because it's quite hard really imagining all the different things that the, uh, in this case, the horse on the ground there may be experiencing. The horse is probably already away from the home stable, already at a uh, horse competition or uh, of some description where there's spectators and show rides and, and lots of other noises and then something goes wrong and more layers or increasing layers of stresses are added from the horse's perspective. So we've got noise and lights, we may have uncontrolled spectators running into the scene. Even what we consider something like uh, helpful, like the horse ambulance arriving, could come with a lot of bang and clang and noise as that happens. And then uh, horses are social animals and often we ask, other horses to be removed from the scene so they don't get in the way. Or well, maybe perhaps one horse might want to stay there. So this is quite an educational uh, trigger, this, this uh, image. So um, it will put a Creative Commons license on it and feel free to use it for your education purposes. So as, um, oops, so there we go. So as we, uh, Thinking about uh, animal welfare at incident scenes, we may be quite familiar with uh, coordinating the zone, uh, different zones to um, help an incident take place. But often the people working on the scene may not be familiar with animals um, or familiar with concepts of animal welfare. And that is the role of the veterinarian uh, most often. Um, when they're involved. So what we thought about doing uh, was preparing a tip sheet or an information sheet that helps responders who may not be familiar with a range of animal species, but in this particular case, large animals and, and horses, um, to help people ask what questions should I ask and what kind of things should I be thinking about? And can any of these things be built into the standard operating procedures? Because um, if, if it happens as a matter of course, as a matter of uh, response, then again, that's an, another built-in welfare measure. So we've been running uh, some workshops and also asking our members online to have a think about uh, what they need to do at an incident scene and do any of these actions that they take have a negative impact or have a positive impact on how that horse in that cartoon perhaps earlier 
um, is experiencing the incident. Now that's quite a shift in thinking um, from what some people may be used to. I've got some prompts down the left side there, but it's quite a good little group activity. You arrive at a, a set incident, what actions are being taken could have a negative impact on that horse's experience. What actions are we taking that could promote positive experiences? Keeping the horse's friend nearby for a bit of social connection would be a positive or considered a positive experience, even for a horse in, that is their own welfare state is compromised because of the incident. And then the second exercise we've taken people through or asked to think about is the same thing. So how do we promote positive experiences for that horse in the, in the image perhaps before the uh, response or the rescue occurs? So while we're waiting for a rescue team to arrive, during it, after, or Perhaps there's times where we're not doing a rescue. The, the flood image that was shown earlier, often them cattle are uh, on higher ground with floodwaters all around. It's just easier to leave, leave a herd there. So how would we think about animals managed in situ? So this before, during, after and in situ then became the framework for developing the tip sheet. So it's set out like this. Um, using the information that we've captured from our members. So our members include responders and veterinarians, and it's been put into those before, during, after, and in situ. Now, I won't go through each of those today, uh, but I'd encourage you to download it. But I'd also encourage you to have a think about it in your own situation, because we're all ge different geographic locations around the world. We all have different resources available or likely to be available, and then thinking about, well, how can, in all that what we do in our decision-making, can we improve the positive experiences of that animal involved or that horse involved? And as with all things we do, we're happy to receive feedback um, and just contact us through the website to do that. So there's a little one that's a little bit closer. So just selected environment. Um, as a generic one for people for today. And you can see on the screen there, perhaps a question to ask um, from responders is, I just must ask the veterinarian, is there anything I can do for this animal before we do the extraction? So it's a question, there might, the answer may be no, but it's a question that could be asked. But, So just in and starting to wrap up, so horse welfare and the safety of horses is a topic of common interest, not only among owners, but also with the public through the social license to operate. Um, we can use the tips, that information sheet as an engagement tool when uh, talking with horse owners, because many horse owners and I, um, perhaps other animal owners too, don't think about preparing for emergencies until after something's gone wrong. So this is something that can be taken to a local horse group or a local uh, livery or adjustment centre. And it's a talking point, something to start it off. We also have uh, sites around the world, but this one's uh, in New South Wales that have lots of uh, preparation information on that can be promoted. And also I'd like to encourage everyone to make sure their animals are, and horses especially are identified so we can reunite animals with owners as quickly as possible. And this tip information sheet can have tips and, and links to that if you develop one for your own area. So just uh, in summary, um, went through the aims of the organisation. We aim to join up the skills and expertise of emergency management with those of veterinarians and other stakeholders. Uh, animal welfare incorporates physical and mental and in particular, uh, in this scenario, we need to think about how do we promote positive experience for horses while they're in their difficult situation? And then the tips for responders um, is a way to help responders have a conversation with veterinarians, whether they're there in person or, or on the phone to help improve 
uh, horse's health at that scene. So a calmer horse feels safer and that equals or should equal or contribute to a safer incident scene for people. So I encourage you to have a look at the website. And as I said earlier, uh, this presentation and, and the tip sheet is uploaded under the resources section. Um, there's our contact details there. And thank you very much for listening today. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, really appreciate uh, all that expertise that goes into these things. I mean, certainly having been a bit of a spectator um, of your activities and those of the rest of the team for a number of years now, I really appreciate the professionalism, the knowledge that goes into this. And as you said so, so eloquently in your presentation, just the thought about about these experiences from the perspective of the horse and I think we all probably in this audience you're probably talking to the converted but we all I think appreciate the you know that that's that's not an obvious thing for some people to consider at the front end of this um and uh so I think to have that explicit and to have the generosity of your resources there available for all of us to share for free and to use that expertise is just a fantastic thing for for, for Australia for all Australian horse owners but also globally now as well um, I don't know if anybody has any questions. I haven't got anything in the Q&A currently, but please um, feel free to put that, uh, put something to Julie if you'd like to. We've got a few more minutes before we need to start thinking about the next um, session. So we do have a few moments. Um, in the meantime, maybe Julie, I can ask a question. Yeah. So I'm intrigued. Um, I think about that perspective taking, you know, that sort of... Um, that kind of obvious but at the same time revolutionary idea about actually these animals <laughs> might have feelings and actually we might have better outcomes if we consider what those are before we actually sort of launch in um, I'm just wondering if you've had any kind of surprising or unsurprising kind of um, incidents while kind of I guess conveying that sort of uh, that different perspective uh, I guess the important thing is not to assume that people mm. understand or think that animals are sentient um, because horses especially have come through history as a tool for, tool for agriculture or a, um, an object for transport. And it's embedded, very deeply embedded in, in much of the language of, of uh, things to do with horses so or how they're thought about. And it's only in recent years that we've uh, started to move away for from that, but um, I would my first suggestion is please don't assume that people understand what sentience is and what this might mean for an animal or how we interact with them. Yeah, absolutely. Might, might have a question there. Yeah, we do have a, we do have one um, uh, attendees asked if it would it be possible to show your last slide again. I know that's a bit fiddly, but at the same time, if it's possible, <laughs> it might be worth a certainly. We'll try and get that up for you. Um, and we do also have a comment here from Anna, who's going to be our next speaker, but she says it's uh, more of a comment than a, a question, but she just um, says, you know, thank you for making those resources shareable. It is important work. And uh, yeah, we definitely agree with that. It's um, it's important and, and it is really is the um, concentration of all that professionalism, that sort of learning along the way, the the um, successes and the, and the uh, challenges that you've faced I guess along the way so hopefully um, you can see that last slide there yes. for that uh, person yes. who was after that information and um, yes as I mentioned earlier Mel it's a, it's a continuous learning progress and, and certainly by the range of people on um, this conference over the next few days um, if people have any feedback we're happy to certainly consider that but also, too, as I said earlier, I'd really encourage working through some of those um, activities with your own local group and using your own local scenarios. Yeah. And I think the other thing is, you know, people don't know what they don't know. And, um, <laughs> and these experiences, um, at least from my understanding from being at your conference this year earlier as well, is that there are so many different people that could be uh, present at these things who yes. haven't haven't dealt with. Um, some element of of the um, of the situation they find themselves in. Um, you know, the veterinarians I'm sure are very good at the the animal health, but perhaps don't appreciate the I guess some of those interactions between the people in that environment as well. The owner is there very much committed to the outcome and the the, the worry for the animal and and um, you know giving them something to do. I think that was one of the things I took away from from your, your conference was was you know, the anxiety of the owner over the horse that's already in a difficult situation is, is 
can be problematic so giving them something to do even if it's going off and making the tea or, or doing something else could be really useful yeah and and certainly the tip sheet could be helped helpful for that you say we've got this tip sheet here we need the owner to go and find the rugs or what yeah. what whatever so it's it's say well this is our procedure for doing this we'd like you to do this to help us complete the rescue yeah yeah absolutely and all the, all the noise the banging and the yeah i find that <laughs> Fascinating. I mean, horses are amazing at the best of times. Horse owners, uh, as a psychologist, horse owners are even better in terms of uh, <laughs> of some of that research. But uh, yeah, I, I I really appreciated your, your uh, presentation today.